Hello and welcome to World Press Freedom Day at the National Press Club. I'm Jen Judson, the 115th president of the National Press Club and land warfare reporter for Defense News. This day will always be special for us at the Press Club, both because of the fit with our own mission, but also because in 2011, the only time World Press Freedom Day was hosted in the United States, it was right here at the Press Club. Uh, we were honored to have journalists from all over the world come here to share their stories and hear important speakers, and we do our best to continue to highlight the special day each year. To start, I'll take you through some of the challenges facing the world in press freedom in the past year, and then we'll hear from our panel to highlight important cases and provide status and context. Along the way, I'll talk a bit about what the club has been doing to try to address these cases. Our work can include press freedom statements, events like this one, and direct actions such as our fall 2021 run for Austin Tice. The club is unique among press freedom organizations as it has significant resources such as membership of working journalists like me. In general, our professional ethics do not allow us to advocate for causes, but we can advocate for our colleagues who are held hostage or otherwise mistreated. And we have resources like this broadcast studio where this event is being produced and the team that runs it. Upstairs at the club, we have some of the finest convening spaces in Washington. And we can and do use all these resources to raise our voice for press freedom. Now, let's turn to what we have seen happening since May 3rd last year. The 2021 withdrawal of US forces from Afghanistan led to a scramble for journalists there. Many struggled to leave the country, knowing they would be targeted by the Taliban. Afghanistan was already a dangerous place for journalists, and for years has been the location of the most fatalities for journalists and many abductions as well. But the takeover by the Taliban created a new dynamic of repression and attack against the free press. We will highlight that in, uh, that happening in Afghanistan in our panel today. Of course, as 2022 emerged, press freedom concerns were apparent right away in Mexico, where now uh, roughly eight journalists have been murdered just in this year. Mexico continues to be one of the most dangerous places on the planet for journalists uh, to work, and we'll highlight Mexico in our panel. Another area of focus this year is Ukraine, uh, where the brutal invasion of Russia is leading to as many as 12 fatalities already among journalists. This is an area of significant interest to me as I have many colleagues and friends who are covering Ukraine and it is a constant reminder of the fact that journalism is a dangerous business and the role journalists play in protecting democracy and freedom of expression through their work. 2022 is also an Olympic year and this year that meant China and the club has highlighted a couple of important press freedom cases in China which has become the number one jailer of journalists in recent years. We will highlight a Chinese case on our panel as well. It is interesting that some of our most significant cases in press freedom are happening in courtrooms, and we will discuss briefly what's happening in the Jamal Khashoggi case and in the case of the Beatles in Syria, which was recently tried in Virginia. We will also focus on a case that is very important to me and related to Syria, the case of Austin Tice. And we'll provide a little context as to what these cases mean in a larger sense in our panel. There were a few positive results in the area of press freedom since last year. We were delighted to see that the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to journalists, including Maria Reza, which is an amazing global breakthrough. And we, at least, and we had at least one successful recovery of a journalist hostage in the Danny Fenster case, so we will highlight both of those things today as well. That is a whole lot to cover, and we're going to try to get through it in 90 minutes, so let's get started. We have a great panel today. Joining us are Jason Rezaian of the Washington Post Opinion section, who has his own experience of 544 days as a hostage in Iran, 
Kathy Kiley, formerly the Press Freedom Fellow at the National Press Club's Institute and now the Lee Hills Professor of Press Freedom Studies at the University of Missouri, and Bill McCarran, the Press Club's Executive Director uh, and a board member of Reporters Without Borders U.S. Jason, let's get started uh, with you and some of the good news. Uh, what does it mean to journalism and press freedom that Maria Reza has won the Nobel Peace Prize? Well, Jen, thank you for having me, and it's it's wonderful to be a part of this illustrious panel on this um, hopefully auspicious day. Um, I've had the good fortune of getting to know uh, Maria Ressa over uh, the recent uh, several years, and uh, you know we're we're part of the same community of people who have been raising our voices, saying press freedom is in trouble around the world. Uh, while I'm so thankful that the Nobel Committee decided um, to, to select Maria and um, her Russian uh, counterpart, um, Dmitry Moratov. Um, I also see their, 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 their prize as kind of a warning to the rest of us, that this is a, an issue that we have to take more seriously, mm -hmm. uh, that journalists are under threat around the world. And you know, the two of them, uh, in, 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 in past times, a Nobel Prize would be kind of a shield of armor, uh, but the mm -hmm. threats against them have actually increased since yeah. they've been, uh, been given this, this, this great distinction. Um, Maria was in town last month. Uh, my wife, Yegi, and I, who works for uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists, had the opportunity uh, of hosting at our, our home for lunch. We had a lovely time with our toddler. Uh, but we also recognize the fact that we not we might not be able to see Maria again for a very long time because of open court cases against her uh, back in the Philippines. I would also say that I, also, I had the, the wonderful opportunity to meet Danny Fenster just last week. And um, look, I, I think we, we do need to focus on the good news stories, mm -hmm. uh, but um, the sad reality is there's there, there, there are a lot more bad news stories, and we have to take this much more seriously. Oh, I, I think we are in we are in a global war um, for freedom of speech, freedom of thought, and journalists really are on the front lines yeah. of that. And I 100% echo what Jason said about um, Maria's case and the Nobel Prize. Um, it's really important. I think the fact that the Nobel Prize was awarded to two journalists. Um, was a significant uh, landmark because it says the Nobel Prize Committee understands just how endangered free speech and, de and the democracy that it supports is. Uh, but I think, so the Nobel Prize Committee was trying to really uh, send up a flare, yep. you know, and say this is an emergency, people, let's pay attention. And it is absolutely true that uh, as we've seen, Dmitry Muratov and Maria Ressa continue to be under threat. Uh, and I will say, I'm a, I'm a double tiger, not just as a, a Missouri School of Journalism professor, but I am an alum of Princeton University, which is Mar also Maria's university. And I am incredibly proud of her classmates uh, from the Princeton class of 86, who just this week launched a drive because they feel that despite the Nobel Prize, she's still under threat. And so they're asking people to subscribe to Rappler because the, ta the tactic that's being used in that case is death by a thousand legal cuts. Uh, Maria's critics keep filing these lawsuits that are bogus lawsuits against her, against Rappler, in hopes that they can bankrupt the publication. So the idea behind this effort by the Princeton class of 86 is to say, subscribe to Rappler. If you can't afford a one-year subscription, which is $72 about, if when you convert the Philippine currency, uh, you can subscribe for a month. It's $8. And, um, and so go on to Rappler, subscribe, and uh, there's a hashtag called Princetonians4, the number four, Maria. And uh, I think it's just a great way to show support. Um, and that is the good news part yeah. for me, is that there are people in the country who recognize, who are not journalists. You know, I've met doctors, lawyers, former diplomats who really have uh, rallied together because Maria has become an avatar of this, this fight for, um, for democracy and press freedom. 
I want to say that I am going to commit to, uh, as soon as we're done here, tweeting out that uh, people should uh, subscribe to Rappler. I hope the four of us all do that and everybody that's watching Please today. Please do. Use our that. hashtag, yeah. Princetonians yeah. for number four, Maria. So Maria was uh, an Obishan Press Freedom winner, and we were trying to get her to come to the States, but she wasn't allowed, and this has been discussed here. There are nine separate court cases against her in the Philippines, and she needs to clear with each court before she's allowed to travel. So I think she had cleared with seven different courts, seven different judges, but didn't get clearance from two, and so couldn't couldn't come. So when Jason says he's concerned he's not going to see her again, this is what she has to go through just to leave the country. What has she told you about her experience? Um, you know, obviously you said you recently met her. Um, what, is, uh, what is her take well, on this? You how, fortunately, she, how is she dealing with it? Uh, Maria is, um, is a, a kind of beacon of hope and, and light um, and the sort of person who is undeterred by, by these threats. But it takes a toll. It takes yeah. a toll on, on I'm, entire communities. I'm going to coin a new term here. She is the acme of resilience. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> she is, yes. she is yeah. just an amazing person. Um, yeah. She does not, uh, to, to Bill's point, um, she was invited to uh, receive a very big award at Princeton and uh, earlier this year. And initially, she was not going to be able to come because she had been one of the many judges in her cases had refused to allow her to come. She filed an appeal, and she won, and she flew all night, got right off that airplane, and got in a car to go to Tom's River High School because she had promised her high school, before she went to Princeton, she was gonna go to her high school and meet those kids. She had had no sleep, she went straight there, and yep. then she went to Princeton and gave an amazing speech. That's who she is. Yeah. Yep. Just remarkable. But. She is a remarkable person, but that kind of remarkable resilience or resilience <laughs> is, uh, has to be supported by people here and people around the world. But really, I think, uh, I th I think I've talked to Maria, and I know she went through some really dark times when she was under attack. Uh, the, the theme at World Press Freedom Day in Uruguay today is about um, journalism under digital attack and she is a perfect example of that. Um, she was under an incredible, a relentless, I mean scores, hundreds, I can't remember the number of tweets a day accusing her of all kinds of stuff and I think it's very dark and I think the smart thing she did was speak out about it. Yeah. She had the courage to speak out and that has ignited this um, a wave of support for her, but I think I think the trick here, and I think this is why her classmates have launched this subscription drive, is you just because you've won the Nobel, as Jason said, it it is not as strong of a shield as we'd like. We have to keep talking about this case because the enemies of press freedom would like nothing more than all of us to get exhausted and stop talking about it. The other really important thing about uh, Maria's case and the Philippines in general is that because of the high levels of internet penetration and, and cell phone usage mm -hmm. uh, going back several years, it's kind of been a, 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 a test site for uh, big tech companies. And she's been sounding this, you know, alarm for years that there needs to be some regulation, that hate speech and uh, negative social media uh, posts do, um, you know, extremely well and there's bot armies. It starts in the Philippines, but what happens in the Philippines spreads to the rest of the world, right? Uh, and I think most folks here in the United States or in Europe don't think about it in that way, but that's the case. There's a reason that it's just now, uh, five years after he's left office, that former President Obama uh, is, is talking about this. We should have been talking about this in 2015. 100%. Maria was talking about it in 2015. 100%. So, you know, here we are now. Um, let's, let's learn the lessons of the last few years and do everything that we can to support her and others who are fighting this important battle. All right. Um, I'm going to shift over uh, and ask you, Jason, about uh, the Danny Fenster case. And that was a cl clear success where an American journalist who was held hostage at, after some interesting, inter interesting diplomacy 
was able to be freed in less than 200 days. So what did we learn from the Fenster case? Look, I mean, I think as we learn from all of these cases, you have to keep a, a powerful light shown on the injustice, uh, calling for, for the release of these these people. Um, Danny, also an Obachon winner. Yes. Um, those of us who've won that award uh, love it in retrospect, but um, don't like receiving it at the time because it usually <laughs> means we're locked up somewhere in a nasty part of the world. Uh, but I think, you know, there are two approaches to these kinds of cases. There is the, the very public facing one that, that the National Press Club and other organizations take. And then there's, um, you know, ones that, that are sometimes termed strategic silence. And I think that, that um, you know, that idea of strategic silence, I've never seen it work. And I'm so fortunate that in Danny's case, uh, we were able to kind of elevate it uh, to such an extent that that we got people to, to notice and and um, there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen on, on, on that one but um, he's home and he's free and um, he's he's free to um, experience life again and I will say though that for those of us who have gone through this in countries like Myanmar like Iran um, Danny and I both chose to go and cover the countries that, that, that we worked in and were ultimately imprisoned in. Um, and ultimately, we've been exiled from those places. So there is, there is a great amount of loss. We shouldn't have to suffer that fate. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think it's important for people to understand that the choice to go into uh, difficult societies and report is one that uh, the vast majority of us take understanding the risks that, that it poses to our mm -hmm. safety, and we do that knowingly because it's that important to us. Well, and, I think and part of the reason, Jason, isn't it because you want to tell the stories of, of those places? Yeah. And the irony to me is that the people who try to shoo away the journalists or imprison them are really cutting off their own noses because you are a bridge to the rest of the world. They don't want that bridge. They want that insular control of their society. Whether it's Iran, whether it's China, whether it's Myanmar, Turkey, you know, Mexico, which we'll talk about. I mean, all of these places, they don't want anybody from the outside looking in and, and, and having more understanding of what's going on. And I think that that's even more of a reason for us here in the United States to look around and say, oh, okay, local newspapers are, are, are drying up, are disappearing. What happens in that vacuum? Abuse of power. Absolutely. I mean, that's exactly the playbook uh, that's going on in, in parts of this country, and, and we need to be really worried about that. Absolutely. You know, I come from the par a part of the country where that's happening a lot, and uh, what I say to people is, you know, we all behave better when we know somebody's watching. Yeah. Yep. And when nobody's watching, that allows people to slide into. I think the genius of when people talk about American exceptionalism, you know, I've traveled around the world, you've traveled around the world. We'd all like to believe that we're special people. But what really makes America special is not our people. There are good people everywhere, but, um, but it's our system of government. And a big part of that system of government and the checks and balances is the free press that is watching and, and minding the store and kind of acting as a hall monitor, I think, in the corridors of power yeah. because people know we're there. And if they know we're there, um, they're going to behave better. If it's a city council that's not getting covered, or a school board that's not getting covered, I think there's a danger that um, people fall prey to the temptations we're all tempted by, you know, and cut corners and start to get lazy. And if, you know, it, it, it happens on the local scene and it happens on the national scene as well. I mean, it, just last night, I mean, we had one of the most remarkable leaks in the history of history. What if the free press didn't exist? What if you know the Supreme Court put out that that decision, that opinion, without any kind of advance notice? Which is what would have happened. Uh, yes, absolutely. Right? So, mm -hmm. 
um, think about that today and, you know, subscribe to your local paper and to Rappler and, Rappler. and to a national one as well. Yes, <laughs> you know? absolutely. We can Support all afford it because we can't afford the opposite. As Al Cross uh, of the Louisville Courier Journal and the University of Kentucky says, he has, he has a bumper sticker made up that says this, uh, support democracy, subscribe. Yeah, that's right. I'd like to get in on the Fenster case just for a sure. second about the role of our government in that case and um, the advice given to the family. So there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen, as Jason said, uh, in, the, in the recovery process. But the reason Danny Fenster is here now is really Bill Richardson. And uh, Governor Richardson, who has a, made a career of trying to meet with um, you know, the kinds of people that, that hold Americans uh, and others hostage. Uh, they're not Boy Scouts, you know, they're, they're, they're bad people. Um, he's effective. He was absolutely told by our government not to go on this mission. And he went in, in opposition to what he was told by our government. And, and he had success. And he took some lumps along the way. But what it shows is you sometimes need an outside of government actor to accomplish something in these cases. But it also calls into question the quality of the advice that our government gives to hostage families. Our government has an agenda. Do they want to get all hostages out? Yes. Are they sometimes more interested in the uh, regional issues and the diplomatic issues and the agenda that we have as a country, yes. Sometimes? <laughs> Always. And, <laughs> and if you're Danny Fenster, there's no big difference for them between 175 days in, in prison and 250 days in prison. Right. They want to do it their way. But this is a guy, he's, he's well, but this is a guy who, when he was in prison, had COVID, we believe. We don't know because they didn't they test, test him, him. Yeah. but he, he believes he had it. So. We learned something. We learned something about success, and we learned something about our government, and these are important lessons as we go forward. And I mean, I think without this community, um, the National Press Club, other press freedom defenders, um, we wouldn't be learning those lessons, right? And we would be taking the advice of governments, and it does take um, a village. Um, and I think that, that we're coming to the realization that the government and non-government actors need to work together and cooperate. There, there, there really should be no partisan politics around the recovery of a, a jailed American, whether they be a journalist or, or somebody else who's being held hostage. Um, it, it should be a national issue. It's one that's getting worse and worse and worse. And if we don't address it now, it's going to get to the point where None of us are going to feel comfortable getting on the plane with our blue passport and going around the world because we will be a target. Absolutely. Uh, I think it really is dangerous. And I just want to add one last thing on the community news side of the house. I came from community news before I became a policy reporter in Washington. And, uh, you know, until we can pay our reporters and community news enough to support their families and to continue on. It's it's not going to be a job that any reporter stays in too long. Um, you know, it's just, it, it, it's too hard. And so, you know, if you can get in and support community news, I think, you know, that's going to be so important. Put, you know, as you said, subscribe to your local newspaper. Um, but, you know, I think we could be doing even more than that um, to, uh, you know, make it more attractive to be a reporter in community news. So just yes, wanted to because point. having that institutional memory, having somebody who's really part of a community and has the institutional memory, I think is really powerful. Um, and you're right, if the salaries don't improve, uh, it's going to be harder to mm -hmm. keep people in those jobs. Right. Sure. All right. Um, I want to jump over and start talking a little bit about Mexico. Um, and for that, I'd like to turn to you, Kathy. Uh, you've worked since 2017 on a case uh, which is of special interest to the club, um, that of Emilio Gutierrez Soto, um, who is a Mexican journalist uh, who was seeking asylum in the U.S., who is seeking asylum in the U.S. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about where we are with Emilio's case, uh, what we might expect this year, um, and how it should be seen against the backdrop of violence that we've seen uh, towards Mexican journalists? 
Um, well, this is a case where I think the current administration has an opportunity to right a um, multi-year wrong. Um, Emilio Gutierrez Soto uh, is another Obishan Award winner, uh, and uh, he came to this country uh, in 2000 eight or nine, I think, um, and he came here legally. Uh, he came through the front door, did everything that the administration says you should do. Uh, he came through a port of entry in Texas seeking asylum. Why was he seeking asylum? Because he was a community reporter uh, working for a small publication in his uh, home community in Mexico, and he reported on local corruption. Uh, the local military was shaking down uh, ordinary residents, and he came under threat. And uh, he was told by a confidential source that he was on a hit list. And as we know, because as you've described, in Mexico that is something you take seriously. At the time, um, he had a young son, a, a preteen, and he was a single dad. He took that boy. Uh, fled to uh, the United States, came in through a port of entry, and requested asylum. And uh, since then, he has lived in the United States. Law-abiding has been a, a, a productive member of every community he's lived in. He lived for a while in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and now lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he was a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan. Um, nonetheless, uh, he has not been granted asylum. Uh, instead, he has been, in fact, twice imprisoned in immigration detention cells, even though he has done nothing wrong, and we can get, the uh, Department of Homeland Security can give us no reason as to why he was detained. As a result, uh, we filed a Freedom of Information Act request for all the internal communications regarding Emilio. And we are still fighting that. That is, uh, I'm a plaintiff in the case, as is the National Press Club's uh, Journalism Institute. And um, we are still, uh, and the, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, I want to give them a big shout out. They've uh, been our lawyers in this case. Uh, and the reason we're doing this and uh, asking for all these documents is we have never been able to understand why the government imprisoned a journalist, the government of the United States. And I will say that recently, uh, just last month, I believe, another journalist who had come from uh, El Salvador uh, and was also imprisoned uh, won asylum in Tennessee, Manuel Duran. We don't begrudge him that at all. That's great. But if Manuel Duran deserves asylum, so does Emilio Gutierrez. Manuel Duran came into this country illegally. Emilio came legally. Now, there are a lot of people who come in illegally because of pressure. They, they can't get to the port of entry. There are some good reasons for that. And that has to do with immigration policy questions. But my point here is that I believe that Emilio is a victim of geography. His case originated in El Paso, which has one of the worst uh, records for granting asylum. And um, I just believe he's a victim of a system that needs to be um, corrected. And it's just incredible to me that the Biden administration has, continues to persist in this case in opposing his asylum. Um, every community that he's lived in, he's won supporters. Um, he is a wonderful human being and by Resisting giving Emilio asylum, what kind of signal are we giving journalists in Mexico who are taking risks every day? If our country really wants to secure its borders, help countries, our neighbors to the south, have a more just society. If you want a more just society, empower journalists. Because for all the reasons we've just said, we are the watchdogs. But if you say to Mexican journalists, if you get in trouble, there's no exit. There's no refuge for you here. How are we supporting that process towards democracy and greater freedom in our neighbors, in countries that are our neighbors to the South? Absolutely. Anyone else want to add to that? Maybe this is for Kathy, but it could be for anybody. Let's connect this to what's been happening in Mexico since right. January of this year. Um, I, th I think we said eight. I, I think it may even be nine it, it, now. It seems uh, to be climbing. The murdered uh, journalists. The 
Kathy knows this well, but this, our State Department will say that it is not a good idea for a Mexican journalist to be extradited to Mexico under these right. conditions. Right. Yet the courts, we've sat in a courtroom in El Paso where the judge said it was perfectly safe to send Emilio back. So our government's not talking to itself. In the, the, the best information our government has is not getting to the people that are making decisions. And yes, it's an immigration case, but it says so much about press freedom. Someone in here should be stepping in. And we, we've just been watching this for uh, years. years not happen. And so if we can't take care of this one, which is very easy, we control everything here, how are we going to help p people overseas? And, and one thing I will add is that Emilio uh, was detained for a second time uh, right after he gave a speech at the National Press Club, That's right. within six weeks. And uh, despite the appeals of the National Press Club, Reporters Without Borders, Committee to Protect Journalists, um, and a host of other professional organizations, despite the appeals of the Bishop of El Paso, um, the Immigration Service would not release him. Um, and finally, we filed this Freedom of Information case and we also filed a writ of habeas corpus to get him out of jail. And when the judge in that case told the Department of Homeland Security, you must turn over all the papers that were, were requested in this FOIA right away under discovery, they released Emilio in mm -hmm. instead. That is why we are pursuing our case, because we think there's something there. Yeah. Why, would, why would you resist all that time and then suddenly cave when you had to turn over documents? And so we're not going to leave any stone unturned, but I think we could end this individual's agony and save our government a lot of money and legal fees. I mean, there are a lot of good lawyers who are being, uh, whose energy is being wasted on this case if we would just uh, do the right thing. Absolutely. And it seems to me that the situation is becoming even more dire as we are seeing, uh, you know, the, the murder rate of journalists in Mexico climb uh, far beyond what we've been seeing in recent years. Bill, I think you may have more statistics off the top of your head over how many total Mexican journalists will, were killed last year versus just in the first few months of this year. It's climbing. Yeah, it's, I'm not sure what the reason is for this, but... It was nine in the first three months of this year. Mm -hmm and it was nine in the entire year of, nine, uh, of 2021. And at nine, journalists killed. That's the second highest total of any country, I think only to India, which is mm. also disturbing. Yeah. But, but uh, that is a, 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 a tremendous problem, uh, obviously, and, and seems quite out of control. And I'll just go a little bit more, something Kathy and I discovered in this. So there's a, there's a program in Mexico that um, purports to protect journalists who are at risk. It's government funded. Mm -hmm. There have been journalists that are in that program that have been killed. And when Emilio's case comes up, the judge points to that program and says, it's no problem to return him to Mexico because they've got this great program. Well, a, a sixth grade paper, you know, could unearth that that's not a workable solution. But in America, this judge, his opinion is that, is that he's the Supreme Court. You know, no one, no one's going to turn him and over. And he's not, he's not really a judge. The immigration judges are not Article Three judges. They are uh, arms of the Justice Department, but they are not actual court judges. And they're overwhelmed. They have way too many cases to decide. And I think this is a, a clear, it, case where you see uh, bad decisions being made uh, for whatever reason. But um, I think, again, as we talked about with Maria Ressa, we really need to um, keep the pressure on and not forget. And Because I think when you see journalists in this kind of trouble, it's a sign that civil society is unraveling. Yeah. And, uh, and if we care about our democracy and our civil society and civilization, <laughs> We need to take a stand on behalf of people who stand up for free pre speech and, and against corruption. And that's what journalism is all about. Right.
One more thing that I would add to just kind of bridge some of this. You talked about the murder rates in Mexico of journalists and, and India as well. Um, you know, there's a very disturbing trend of, of journalists being killed, murdered, um, in democratic societies. You know, um, India and Mexico have democratic institutions. I mean, they're, they're not fully functioning democracies the way that they maybe used to be, especially in the case of India. But we have a real responsibility here, and our government has a responsibility here to call for accountability in these cases. And uh, I, I can't. I can't recall the exact statistic, but in the cases of journalists who are murdered, there is almost never a trial mm -hmm. in these countries, mm -hmm. right? And so if the United States of America is, uh, is not defending these very basic principles that we have in high profile cases, mm -hmm. thanks to the National Press Club and, and, and others who worked on Emilio's case, what single does that send to these foreign governments about what they can get away with in terms of abusing journalists? That's a question uh, that I, I don't really want to answer, uh, but mm -hmm. I think we all understand um, what's at stake. Well, and I think that's why we're all here. Yeah. And why uh, institutions like the Press Club are doing what they do, because journalists have realized we have to speak out for ourselves and yeah. our colleagues, mm -hmm. because not enough other people are. You know, there's been a, a, a real dehumanizing of, of journalists, and we can point back to Maria uh, and Emilio's cases um, as prime examples of that, the way that my colleague Jamal Khashoggi was brutally murdered um, in, in Turkey in, in his own government's consulate. Uh, these are not the ways that you treat human beings, fellow human beings. And I think that it's, it's, it's essential that we not only stand up for ourselves, but you know, do a better job of reconvincing the public that we aren't the bad guy, right? All we're doing here is exposing the realities in our societies and our communities. Um, and as we said earlier, without that basic service, people are gonna be out in, in the dark and those with power will abuse it. Whether it's in China, whether it's in Turkey, whether it's in Mexico, whether it's right here in Washington, D.C. We've seen it just a couple of blocks away uh, in, in recent years. And unfortunately, it's ongoing. So, you know, today is the day to take stock and uh, subscribe. Subscribe to Save Your Democracy. Do we expect he will be granted asylum? Uh, you know, what's our best guess in terms of the Emilio, in, in terms of Emilio's case, uh, how it may play out uh, in the coming months, in the, in, in the coming year? You know, I think that is one of the cruelties of our um, totally messed up immigration system, uh, which I covered when I worked here. And um, it is that the, um, there's no deadline. And so Emilio's been, this case has been dragging on for 14 years, 14 years. His son who came here as a pre-teenager is now an adult, an employed adult in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And this has dragged on for so long and there's no no idea of what will happen. Um, it is now before the Board of Immigration Appeals for the second time. Um, I think I speak for everybody at the National Press Club when I say if Emilio uh, loses that case, we will go to federal court. Um, we are prepared. to. We're in this for the long haul. And here's the other thing. So are a lot of really great lawyers. I mean, that's the good news. I have been so inspired by the number of high quality people this case has brought together who have donated their time to try to make sure the right thing is done for Emilio Gutierrez Soto. So we don't know. I wish I, wish I could give you an answer, but we don't know. Well, we'll continue to watch that and hope, hope for the best and hope a decision uh, to grant him asylum happens soon. Um, yeah, let's let's uh, move over and, and speak a little bit about uh, Afghanistan. So, th you know, the last time there was a full-on war even close to Ukraine was Afghanistan, which ended very badly last year. Um, and for this the segment on Afghanistan, we want to bring in Zaki Daryabi um, of Etilatros. Am I pronouncing that correctly? <laughs> okay, one of the leading independent uh, journalism organizations in Afghanistan. Uh, Zaki, welcome. Um, I understand you're working at the club today. Can you tell us what you're doing? 
Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and in bringing the Afghanistan case here. It is an honor to meet you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm busy with uh, three parts of work. One, I'm working with the journalists who are still in Afghanistan, and they are collecting information from across of Afghanistan in the provinces in a very hard situation. And also, I'm managing a team who are not in Afghanistan, but uh, they are working with the, the team who are in Afghanistan. They are in, in Albania, Spain, mm. Turkey, Pakistan, here in DC, in Washington State, in a lot of different parts of the world. So I'm managing everything that still it allows to be active, and we have the flow of information from Afghanistan, what's happening uh, around the country. The second is this, that uh, how uh, we can establish Italatros again, because we lose a lot of uh, journalists who are not working uh, with us now, because they just uh, become immigrant to many countries, and we do not have the budget to uh, hire them and to restructure the Italatros. Uh, we just established the printed version in Afghanistan. It's not possible anymore to publish uh, the printed version, so we are an online platform. And we need to uh, restructure our team, uh, the organization, uh, uh, to be flexible on what's happening in Afghanistan, what the government is making a decision that we can deal with. And the third is uh, that uh, we are working with uh, a lot of friends uh, among the media community to restructure all the media institutes. Uh, everyone is in the same trouble as we are in Italatos. So everybody is uh, looking to find a way uh, which policy is sustainable for the safety of journalism in Afghanistan, which policy are effective for the future of media in Afghanistan, and how uh, we can be stronger uh, as a media as we were in the past two decades. These are the things that I'm uh, busy with, and I, th I think many friends uh, uh, from Etelatro's colleagues to another media athletes has the same responsibility these days. Okay. I, I just would like to say I think that is a model that um, we really need to follow. Um, you know, we're, we've talked about how many crises there are in journalism worldwide, it's kind of like whack-a-mole, uh, because I do think President Biden's right when he said there's a war for democracy, mm -hmm. and so you see journalists under threat in so many places. What I like about this idea that Zaki has is, um, I think the internet, although it has caused a lot of problems for us, as we've discussed, it opens a possibility of doing cross-border journalism, which I think is the ultimate, if you'll pardon me, middle finger salute to the bad guys. <laughs> if you just say, okay, you've driven us out of your country, you've exiled us, as uh, Jason talked about, but we are still going to do our work. Mm -hmm. And we had a uh, journalist from Pakistan uh, at the University of Missouri uh, a year ago on an uh, Alfred Friendly Fellowship, and he has broken story after story after story that has had an enormous impact in his home country. I think Imran Khan had to resign in, mm -hmm. in part because of the work of Ahmad Durrani. So I think if we take a, ch a page of that, that we can, we <coughs> as journalists and journalistic institutions here can support journalism that continues to go into Afghanistan, it would be a great thing. We are bringing an Afghan journalist named uh, Zabihullah Ghazi, uh, who worked for the New York Times and Voice of America, to the University of Missouri. And I know our good friend Lynette Clemenson has uh, two Afghan journalists at the University of Michigan, Arizona State is supporting journalists, Princeton University is supporting an Afghan journalist. And I think if more of us can do that and figure out a way, I think the, the painful part for me is the need is so great, mm -hmm. I wish I could do more. Right. Um, and I, you know, I invite, I'm gonna make a call here, funders, uh, phil philanthropic organizations, here's an opportunity for how to really make a difference, um, support a network of Afghan journalists in the United States and globally, uh, wherever they are. I'm sure your colleagues must be all over, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and let them, to support them and let them create a network and do their journalism and send it back into Afghanistan. It's possible. We can do that. Why don't we do it? 
And that is your model, right, Zach? And you are supported in part by uh, funders, uh, NGOs, that sort of thing, grants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deep Lotus has had a lot of uh, uh, trying to work with the founders who are supporting freedom of expression in Afghanistan. And there's a lot of other media outlets that have the same relation. So this is a very good idea. Uh, that's what uh, a lot of uh, journalists in exile seeking uh, to go to universities to work with the other journalists. And I think uh, what's happening in the ground in Afghanistan is also very useful because We've seen in the past 10 months that the Taliban, is, uh, uh, the Taliban behavior with foreign journalists are much different from the local journalists mm -hmm. and the national journalists. When they take a local journalist, they beat them, they torture right. them. But even when they face with New York Times or many other athletes, they just uh, uh, give them a stage, they just uh, collaborating with them, and they actually guard them to go somewhere, uh, provide a report. So for the long term, I think uh, behind the uh, studies opportunities, the work between international journalists and local journalists are very important. And this is the way that we need to uh, provide a mechanism for that, how we can collaborate in the future. And I'm, I'm just calling the same thing you called. Uh, let's not forget Afghanistan and let's uh, Go uh, for the journalists who are in Afghanistan in who are outside Afghanistan, but still they continue their work in Afghanistan. I think what Zaki said is so right. Have a model because this is going to keep happening. Right. I mean, Afghan journalists need help. Russian journalists need help. Mm -hmm. People are being exiled from Russia, and it would be great if we could continue that work. You know, VOA can only hire so many people, so. Uh, how are we as a community of people who care about democracy, not just the journalism community, because we're already doing a lot, but we need other people who care about democracy to step up and, and help make this happen. Because mm -hmm. I think there does need to be a model. Every time something like this happens, and sadly it's going to continue to happen for a while, uh, we need to help not just, I'm going to steal a line from Lynette, mm -hmm. um, not just save the journalists, but save the journalism. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's also it's a you know it's a living, breathing ecosystem, right? The work that that Zaki and um, and Etalat Ruz does in their organization uh, can can work with organizations like VOA who may not be able to get back into the country, right? We have to look at this as kind of a collaborative effort to um, to support the ongoing work of uh, journalism in exile. Uh, but also to uh, to strengthen the journalism that is uh, is operating freely. I saw this while I worked in Iran for many years. I mean, there, there's only so much access you can get as a foreign journalist mm -hmm. in in some of these countries. You rely on those individuals who are steeped in the place, native to the place, who may not be able to work out in the open, uh, but want to get information out. And we have to do kind of a. Uh, you know, a, a, a crowdsourcing of 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 journalism, right? Um, and I think that that might be the way forward in in some of these countries that are under such such threat. Yeah, and from Zaki, I've learned there's some practical issues too. You can't just <coughs> pull up your stakes and three months later be operating fully. He's got a grant, but the grant is written as if they're all there in mm -hmm. Kabul, mm -hmm. and now he's got to go and rework the grant to state the condition of the enterprise now. And that sounds easy, but it's not. It's, it's a lot. And so in the interim, what happens with funding? You know, how does he hold his network together? There, there are lots of lessons here, and uh, I think they're doing a great job, but uh, funding, more funding is helpful, but also expertise. How do you, how do you manage uh, when something like this happens. Um, he, they have a practical problem about paying uh, the people that work for them in Afghanistan. So there's lots of, there's lots of issues. Uh, it's not just push a button. Right. Um, and people like Zaki and his team are uh, both doing the work but showing us the way to go. 
And, and Zaki, our, our, many of our viewers may not be aware of your story, so um, would you mind uh, walking us through um, you know, what uh, happened to you in Afghanistan um, you know, as, as Kabul was falling, uh, how you were able to get out? Uh, just talk a little bit about that, that story. Yeah, uh, so uh, I, I was in Afghanistan when Kabul just fallen in 15 August. And I decided to stay in Afghanistan, and I stayed until 3rd October of 2021. In 8th uh, eight September, uh, there was a protest around our office and PD3. So my colleague uh, went to cover that. The protest was by the woman. And uh, Taliban just took two of our journalists, one Taki Daryabi, my little brother, and Nemat Nakhbi. Then we just uh, decided to go to talk with the Taliban. So our editor and two other colleagues just went to talk with PD3, that they are a journalist. Then when they arrived, they just took all of them. So five of our colleagues just uh, detained by the PD3, and then two of them tortured for hours. Mm -hmm. And I, I know every, everybody knew the, the, that story. After that, uh, tortured uh, until he. It became unconscious. Exact time. Yeah, and those were the pictures time. that went yeah. around the yeah. world, yes. right? Yeah. Of their. Uh, I called on Taliban that you should answer on this case. And I called to the international community that it's very important. It's the first case that is happening in Afghanistan. I was waiting for many days. What will be the reaction of the Taliban? Do they bring the soldiers in the PDP staff to uh, accountable or not? So they didn't. Then uh, instead of that, they just called me that you should come to. Uh, in this intelligence agency and we have to apologize from you and we have a lot of other things to tell to you. Yeah. So uh, no I think that it is not <laughs> the way because we have our address, this is my office, if you don't know, please come. Yeah. And you should uh, apologize from the, my colleagues who have been tortured by, by you. Uh, it's not me. Then, if you have uh, a farmer older and other older in this organization or with me, to come please here. So, after 10 days of calling from Ministry of Interior, uh, NDS, and Intelligence uh, Directory, I realized that it's uh, not a place that you should stay. Then, uh, uh, we I just fled in 3rd October uh, the country and then had a lot of. Uh, time uh, just passed because I don't have internet and missed my connection with the, the colleagues. But, uh, and now, uh, after <coughs> more than a month, I just uh, arrived in Maryland. This is uh, You went what, through Doha? Yeah, I was in Doha, that why I left the country. And then all the colleagues were agree that we should leave the country now, especially the staff who are very famous. Mm -hmm. They, the, their names were in the websites, the, their contacts were in the database. So what happened with Taqi and Naqdi could be happening with everyone of Yatul Atros too. Because we, there was not just Talib, Yatul Atros was an investigative outlet, so there was a lot of people who was in anger with Yatul Atros. They uh, I, I, include the past government officials. So this is uh, why I leave uh, Afghanistan, yeah. How are the journalists uh, still on the ground uh, in Kabul and elsewhere in Afghanistan um, faring? Can you talk a little bit about the reporters that still are re reporting for you? Exactly. There's uh, two kinds of uh, journalists in Afghanistan. One who are working with uh, established media by the Taliban, by the government. And they are working very freely. The style is very different. The way they mm -hmm. report is very different. The TV channels are very different. But there's an independent media who are working still in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, in this area, they don't have freedom. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't go to everywhere to report. Uh, they just affair what's happening because there is no role. The Taliban announced today that we support free media in Afghanistan. The reality is this, that they still don't know what are the legal framework for a journalist in the media sector in Afghanistan. What we had from the past, they just destroyed. <laughs> the institutions, legal frameworks, 
and many mechanism that was established by international community and national community in Afghanistan. So uh, when Zabiullah Mujahid in Kabul were uh, telling this that uh, we are supporting free media, the reality is this, that the soldier and a fighter in Pakya, Bamiya, and Khost can kill everyone, can kill every journalist, can detain, can abandon, can uh, anything that, that, that they, they have the right to do that because they don't know what, what is calling from Kabul. So a lot of journalists inside Afghanistan include Itala Trusty, work anonymously. Their names are not in the website. Uh, their names are not in reports. I, yesterday, a, a former colleague of me, who is not working with Itala Atrus now, just received uh, three times a call from National Directory, uh, uh, I mean uh, intelligence agency, that why publish this report? Because you are the past uh, reporter here for Itala Atrus. They just uh, told that you published this report, but the reality was this, that he's not working with Tlatros anymore. So they just found who was working in the media and putting a lot of pressure on them. This is uh, the situation that uh, we face in Afghanistan. Mm. Your flight, when you left, took off at 3 p.m. Tell everybody what happened at 4 p.m. At 4 p.m., there was just uh, uh, a person from the Taliban, I think he is now a uh, spokesperson for the uh, high court. Just mm -hmm. came with a lot of uh, Indian soldiers and surrounded my office and came to the office and looked into the toilets everywhere, where is Zaki, where is everyone here? And this is what happened actually on that day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, anyone else have questions for, for Zaki? Um, I was interested, Zaki, in what you said about missing the connections with your colleagues and how important is it for you to have reconnected and made, be starting to work as a journalist again? Uh, it is the biggest issue that I'm dealing with. Every day I'm working with freelance for the Pilatus, but actually I'm working with the Pilatus and for the Pilatus. There's the different time zones that I need to be connected with. And sometimes at four in the morning, I'm, I, I need to be aware to just uh, receive a call or meet, meet, meet some people. So this is very important. Then the uh, important thing is that what the journalists who are working uh, now with us in Italatus, many of them are not so experienced. But the team who left Afghanistan are experienced. The UN capability, capability that they had for the Ethel Atros is necessary for us to re-engage with the local uh, journalists who are in Afghanistan, because it's about the audience. Audience just expected uh, the quality that we had before, but they don't know what <laughs> a lot of things <laughs> changed in Afghanistan. So they expect the same. And our mission is this, how we can uh, re-engage the teams and have them together and, and uh, rebuild the, the, the confidence that the audience had to. And to where, are you, where is your staff now? How many countries are they uh, scattered among? They are in Canada. They are mm -hmm. in many countries in the Europe. They are in, in the U.S. They are in Albania, Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and many wow. other countries, I think. So CNN, CNN says they're the worldwide network. You're the worldwide yeah. network in news. <laughs> you had 50 people on your staff, yeah, at the time of Kabul fell. Uh, no. We were, no, we were 40. 40? Yeah, we okay. were 40. Yeah, we were. Mm -hmm. I, I also have a question, Zaki. Mm, your whole life you must have been hearing about the United States of America. Now you're here. Um, the working conditions as a journalist and the support that you have received and maybe some of the support you hope to receive but haven't received, how has the reality of coming and living and trying to work here been different or the same as what you expected? Uh, I, 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 I just lived in Afghanistan all of my, my age. I was not aware what's hap what does it mean if you live in the U.S. or any other country like uh, 
so there's a lot of difference between living in Afghanistan and the US. I face with a lot of challenges in my private life, but the good thing is this, that we know what journalism is, what Yetalat was doing. So it, it just uh, make it easier to work from here and to uh, be aware what's happening in Afghanistan as well. So I, I think uh, if everything is going to according to the plan, then it's, it will be easy for us to restart Etelatros uh, again here and work as effective as we <coughs> work in Afghanistan. It maybe takes some months, but I'm, I'm, hopefully, I'm hopeful that uh, the team will re-engage together and we will work with the team who are in Afghanistan and we have the same content uh, that we had in Afghanistan. Just we don't have the print version, but instead we are trying to bring some more changes in Etelatros to do video reporting uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, I feel like it is possible. It is, it is hard, but we need time. We need uh, more support. We need an immediate support uh, to relaunch the Etelatros. This is what I feel is easy to achieve. Zaki, any closing remarks? I, uh, I think what, what's happening with Italatros and what I'm talking uh, is uh, the, an issue for all media organizations, but the important thing is that we need to, uh, to put a pressure on the Taliban, that they should be aware <coughs> of freedom of expression. This is a basic right. Uh, they should uh, respect the journalists who are in Afghanistan and working in a very hard situation. They should not be uh, censored. They should not be detained. They should not be tortured. They should not be beat, beaten. And unfortunately, this is happening. So uh, what, what the media organization in Afghanistan is expecting is uh, how we can work in a mechanism that international community should be engaged with the civil society of Afghanistan, media, and also human rights defenders protect them, to support <coughs> them, and to put a pressure on the Taliban that they should respect this right. How we can uh, bring uh, the issue of uh, freedom of expression as a benchmark for every donation <coughs> to Afghanistan. Uh, this is the way that I think is useful uh, for Afghanistan. And this is an idea that uh, uh, we in third day <coughs> in any opportunity is seeking to find a, a way to work with the international community to raise this voice that the Taliban should uh, respect the freedom of expression in Afghanistan. And uh, many journalists in Afghanistan, many editors in Afghanistan today called on Taliban. That is uh, something that are very important <coughs> for the future of Afghanistan. If, if uh, you want a, a good Afghanistan for the future, in the future, so, we should respect the freedom of expression. We should uh, accept that media, the media should be <coughs> active in Afghanistan, and the journalists just work uh, very freely. And this is the call that uh, I see everyone posted in social media and call to the Taliban. Thank you, and my apologies for coughing through all of your closing <laughs> remarks. I'm, I have uh, allergy season has yes, really been is, hitting yeah. me hard. Um, thank you again for taking the time and for sharing your story today. Yeah, we know you must be very busy, and uh, good luck. Um, thank you very much. Anything we can do to support you, I think, <coughs> supports press freedom uh, around the world. And I think a strong government should be able to handle a strong press. So uh, good, good reporters make uh, politicians better, so they should understand that. Uh, thank you very much, Maggie. Thank, thank you, Zaki. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you so much. Yeah, you now, can stay, you now can let's. Go. Oh yeah, yeah. Feel free to to remain sitting if you'd if like. You have to yeah. work though. Yeah. We, we, yep. we, we don't want to keep you from anything important, but okay. please. Uh, <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about another case that we've worked on over the years, um, where we really hope for an outcome this year, and that is a case of Austin Tice. Uh, even though Austin has not been released, it's been a momentous year in his case. Bill, do you want to take us through uh, through it from May of last year? Sure, but I think we should probably talk about what's happened in the last 48 hours, which has been yeah. I incredible. Uh, <coughs> when we wrote this, we didn't know there were going to be breakthroughs in, in Austin's case. So for the last, uh, since August of last year, which is usually 
uh, there's a cluster of stories about Austin around August because that's both his birthday and that's uh, that's a time that we're recognizing his uh, his detention. Um, there's been a campaign led primarily by the Washington Post uh, Press Freedom Partnership and others um, to get two things out of the administration. One, uh, encourage the president to say Austin's name, which was until recently something he had not yet done. And two, to encourage the president to meet directly with the Tice family, which was something he hasn't done and, and, and no president has done. This case has gone across uh, three administrations. Uh, they, they met briefly with uh, President Trump at, at the gridiron. Uh, it was a walk-up thing. And uh, he seemed to be pretty engaged uh, at that point. Um, so getting on the president's to-do list uh, is, a, is a vital thing. It was vital in, in Jason's case. Um, and it, it, it takes a while. And so the Tices have been at this in a really vigorous way, uh, including uh, December of last year when they came, uh, Mrs. Tice came here to do a news conference Jen, you interviewed her then, right. and uh, she made st strong points that uh, it, it, it had gone as far as it could go with the current structure, which is the um, uh, SPIHA, the, the Special <sighs> Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. Thank you. you. <laughs> uh, it's Washington, so you got to have an acronym. Right. Um, and and it had moved into the National Security Council, which arguably is where cases like this should be. Um, and so there, there's, been, uh, there's been conflict. There's been conflict with what the government wants to accomplish versus what the family wants. There's been all kinds of, uh, of hurdles and, and disruptions. But the Tices figured that nothing was going forward until the president started saying their son's name and meeting with them. And uh, uh, also Fred Ryan figured that out, and he's been very strong in this case. Publisher, publisher of the Washington Post. Of yeah. the Washington Post. Um, and so uh, the press club has been very involved in Austin's case, and uh, Mrs. Tice comes here to Washington frequently. Every time she does, she's at the club. We're trying to do events for them. We're trying to uh, keep the pressure on. Last year, we created a uh, change.org petition, which had 150,000 signatures. As Jen mentioned, we had a, a run for Austin. This is all just engagement, ways to keep bringing his case to the fore. Uh, where we are now is that, uh, so I you know, probably I, um, had a brief conversation with Deborah yesterday morning. Austin's uh, mom. <coughs> Austin's mom, Deborah Tice. She had been here to the White House Correspondents' Dinner. The White House Correspondents' Association did a marvelous job of uh, putting the spotlight on her. Jen was in the room there. Yep. Um, she, uh, the, he, the, they called her out. The president then in his own remarks, which followed that moment, um, great applause for her. Uh, the president said, uh, Mom, I want to talk to you mm -hmm. and Dad about your son. That was, that was his recognition. Big. According to Jen Psaki, then the staff went into high gear to try to make that meeting happen. I, and I love it, and I'm not throwing any stones. But why does the staff have to hear that from the president to know that they need to go into high gear to get a man out who's been being held for a, almost a decade, an award-winning journalist, a Marine who served his country, a one passport holder, American, why does the staff need to hear the president say that? So this is part of how <coughs> things work. So if you go back six months ago and you read what Jen Psaki is saying in December, <coughs> you'll read that, oh, we have a way of handling these things. We can't get out ahead of ourselves. Sometimes if we mention the case, it raises you know, uh, expectations. It can cause problems. You know, Our government is omnipotent, right? They, they have all the information. And how can you really have an opinion about what we should or shouldn't be doing? Well, if your kid has been held for 10 years, you do have an opinion. And you do know what's best. And you can push. 
And so the Tices are a remarkable family. They have been vigorous in their advocacy for their son. And uh, we seem now to be at a moment where something is going to happen. And just to dial back a little bit, it goes beyond the time you were asking. At the very end of the Trump administration, a three-person team went to Syria. Now, we don't have diplomatic relations with Syria, so that's complicated. But they met with the Syrians about a number of issues, including what would it take to free Americans that are being held in Syria. And there are six Americans, I believe, being held in Syria. Austin is the only journalist of those six. Um, the Syrians put an offer on the table. Our government took that offer back and has not responded. That was September 2020. Understandable there was a change in administration. Now a new team comes in. They have to learn everything, the Biden team. But we're, you know, quite a ways into that now, and still there has not been a response. And so part of why there has not been a response is because the president has not been personally engaged. The president needs to green light these sorts of things. And so we saw with recently uh, Trevor Reed, uh, not a journalist, but Trevor Reed was released. It was because of engagement with the president. The president was openly telling R Russians, apparently in calls and meetings, he was raising the issue of, of Trevor Reed. The parents of Trevor Reed held up a sign in, in Fort Worth, near an airport where the president was departing. The president drove by in a limousine. The family is holding a sign. It was not a good optic. So more, more calls, more activity. This is, a, this is hard to get on the to-do list of the President of the United States. And so my question for all of us on World Press Freedom Day is, practically that is what needs to happen. Should it be that hard in a world where we have a spiha, in a world where we have uh, we don't have to convince our society that pr the press is a fundamental and important thing. Why is it so hard? Why are these cases so hard? And uh, I'm just grateful in Austin's case that it looks like finally, after a decade, we're getting somewhere and there could be action. I have nothing, good to, nothing but good stuff to say about the administration now. But the process is... Yeah, it, it doesn't need to be this hard. Yeah. Um, and I think something that you alluded to earlier was the notion that, um, you know, there are other geopolitical matters at play in all of these relationships, and I get that. I experienced it in my own situation. But um, as we learned in, in, um, in my case, in Trevor Reed's case, the Fenster case, you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? And it's uh, terrible to say that, but it's true. Um, I want to encourage all journalists listening today to cover this uh, type of story more vociferously, more regularly. Um, we shouldn't have to wait for anniversaries in someone's case, whether it's 10 years that Austin's being held or his birthday um, or, you know, a whole host of other things. We should be doing what we need to do to bring, bring Americans home. Tomorrow, uh, May 4th, Wednesday, uh, at 11 a.m., uh, several of the families will be gathering of current hostages being held by various governments around the world. The Reeds, um, Joey, uh, Trevor's dad, and his sister Taylor will be there, um, along with, with other family members, trying to elevate this issue. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I think... We shouldn't have to beg. Yeah. Right. But in the meantime, until there is a deterrent, an effective deterrent for hostages, um, for, for governments taking hostage, uh, American citizens, we're going to have to keep raising awareness around the issue and make everybody care. This is not a partisan issue. This is an American issue. Get out there, support people, and... Um, and tell your representatives that, uh, that you're mad as hell and you don't want any more Americans hostage taken. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the things that surprises me most is that you know, Deborah Tice has met with 
Biden administration officials, but you know, there's that disconnect, right? That's it's so frustrating that it took a public remarks and then finally Biden saying something during an event with thousands of people and journalists to make it happen rather than just an administration official saying, listen, this is important, let's put this well, on a schedule. Yeah, I mean, and I think I think the priority mm -hmm. question, as, as Bill said, it is difficult. Uh, the president has a lot to do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, President Biden in his inaugural address made a remarkable statement. You know, he said, we're in a war for democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, of course, subsequent events have proven him 100 percent right. Um, and in a war for democracy, what greater priority, what greater national priority could we possibly have than defending the people who represent and enact the very first amendment in our Bill of Rights. I mean, I just can't imagine anything more important than freedom of the press. And, um, and I think Joe Biden understands that. He's been a politician for a long time. I covered him on Capitol Hill. He, he understands the role the press plays. Um, and so I would just hope that this administration uh, would really step up and make it clear to our allies and our enemies that if you mess with the press, America is, you're not going to be on America's good side. That is what it really is going to take. And I don't think that's clear. I think that's a very important point, Kathy, you're yeah. making. Yeah, absolutely. Can, can I just say one last thing about this? If all that was wrong with our government policy in this area was inaction. Uh, that would be itself bad enough when you're talking about somebody being in prison for uh, 10 years. But there's pretty clear evidence that during the Trump administration, um, it was more than that. So John Bolton, in his book, bragged about how he and Secretary Pompeo would distract President Trump when he would become agitated about the fact that, for example, Austin was being held, mm -hmm. and would go find them in the White House and would say, what are we, I want to know what we're doing, this sort of thing. Trump, many flaws, but he did seem to really be interested in, in hostages and trying to free them. And um, uh, Bolton would say, well, we would, we would come up with something else. We would tell him, oh, that's being taken care of. So on purpose, they were keeping a Marine, you know, an American, a journalist, held longer in jail because they didn't want the president digging into it because it would screw up their sort of vision of what to do in the region. So they, they hate Iran, you know, they don't like Syria, they, and you know, Syria being a sort of a proxy state there in some ways. They did not want uh, something that would upset their, their own diplomatic agenda. That is, to me, uh, wholly unforgivable in, in government. That is the opposite of the Hippocratic Oath, right? And uh, so it's not just ineptitude or inaction. It is sometimes on purpose that our government is not helping, doing the opposite of helping. Mm -hmm. Right. Now we're we're getting close uh, to uh, we ha we have plenty of topics left and not much time oh, here. Okay. Um, so I want to I want to shift over uh, since since we were speaking about uh, Austin Tice, uh, we've had a, a new guest join us, uh, Mohammed Mosayed. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. <laughs> yes, um, Jason. Um, you are the only one of us on the panel who spent time in prisons. Um, we wanted to give you an opportunity to talk Great. about those things. Uh, how, how things are going in Iran related to the jailing of journalists yeah. and um, Mohammed is, is uh, somebody who is a special guest of yours so if you'd like to make some introductions sure. on, on Mohammed. Sure. Uh, Mohammed Mossad uh, is a journalist from Iran. He has been uh, living here in the United States for almost a year. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> arrived here uh, under similar, similarly harrowing circumstances uh, as Zaki uh, Daryabi, um, and had spent uh, a significant amount of time in the same prison that, that I did, Avin Prison in Tehran, over a tweet. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, and and now he's here, and uh, I think we're super thankful uh, that he's here. He uh, is part of a, a, a group of journalists in Iran who have continued to be critical of the government to uncover corruption, financial corruption within the regime, which is rampant in Iran, uh, and in some ways uh, made him public enemy number one. Um, and I think that, that it's a testament to uh, the, the press freedom community uh, that, that we stood up for, for Mohammed uh, when he was in trouble uh, back in 2020. And, and here he is now, uh, but similarly exiled from, from his homeland, um, but continuing to stay on top of uh, the case, uh, cases in, in his country. Um, I, I guess I'll ask the first question, and I would love it, you know, because you know I know a lot about Iran and and uh, have spent time there. But what I want to know is, um, what is it like to leave your country and come to the United States uh, and try and establish yourself as a journalist reporting on Iran from the United States? Yeah, well, thanks for having me here. It's too hard. Uh, it's a nightmare for every journalist uh, to have a, a long distance like that. And they, uh, you know, I can't uh, speak even with my family. Uh, and it's a valid um, fear in anybody in my country, country to speak with me and people like me. and. Uh, it's the worst uh, situation for every journalist in the world to uh, work uh, in situation like that. Yeah. Because uh, we can speak with people fairly. We can travel to Iran. Uh, we can uh, see anything in um, directly. And uh, it can be worst every day by every day because uh, someday we, can, we can't figure out what happens in our country. Uh, and I think uh, you uh, exercised that for many years. And you can see people who lived our country 10 years ago have big problems uh, that people like me. And, but there is uh, some journalist can't see Iran, uh, couldn't see Iran for 20 years. It's worse than that. And uh, you know when you can uh, do your job in country like Iran, the big problem is you don't know what you don't know. Right. And it's the biggest problem about countries like Iran and doing this job in these countries. You've been here now for 10 months, 11 months. Yes. Uh, 10 months. You, you just received the permission to work in this country. <laughs> yes. How can the United States, um, the bureaucratic system, but also the press freedom community, support you uh, in establishing yourself in this country and allowing you to return to the important work of covering Iran? Yeah, uh, my dream is to I uh, have a platform in this country to say about Iran uh, because you know you can see I haven't a good English yet, but uh, I'm a new guy from that country. Yeah. Uh, ten days, uh, ten years in future, probably I have a good English. But I'm an old guy from that country. <laughs> I know the I, feeling. Yeah. <laughs> I know a platform to say about Iran today, yeah. not 10 years in yeah. future. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that, that that's right. I mean, we really need to support he and people like Zaki. It, they're connected right now to the pulse of what's going on. It's been six years since I was released from Iran. I still write about Iran. I often said that if I left this place, I would, would stop writing about it. But then I realized, in this town, there's nobody that's been there more recently than, than, than me, yeah. except this guy. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and, you, yeah. and you knew Muhammad. 
So I think I think this gets to the point that we were talking about earlier, which is um, we have the technology now to empower people like Muhammad yep. to still continue to build a network, people like Zaki, to continue to do journalism. And the other thing that I think is so important is if you have to leave your country and you leave everything that's familiar to you, your network, your language, your family, the one thing we should be able to give you here in the United States of America is your job, yeah. your profession, which is built into our Constitution. We should support journalists doing journalism here to send to your home countries. And I think that's one of the biggest contributions we could make for world democracy. Um, and it's so important for the world. It's also important, it's important politically yep. because it helps beat down corruption and advance democracy. But it's important psychologically I mean, I the the Afghan journalist who's going to come to Mizzou, you know, he and I were having dinner, and he's like you, he's learning English, and I said, you must be exhausted because you must be thinking, but there's a really smart person in here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if only I could speak the English, um, but he pulled out his phone and he showed me his beautiful family, and he said, you know, I had a really nice life in Afghanistan, I had a big family, I had a lot of friends, I had a good job. And I thought, I can't give you your family back. I can't give you your friends back. But I can give you journalism. Yeah, and I think that we need to do more to support that. I've known so many people, uh, like Muhammad, like my own wife, like Zaki. I think if you did a survey of all of these folks, uh, if they had their druthers, they'd be back in their home country doing their job. And um, there is a real need for the information, insight, and analysis that these folks can provide us here. I have uh, called for uh, both in, in my columns at the Post, but also in conversations with folks in government, to streamline the process for folks like Zaki and Mohammed who are arriving here who can contribute to our understanding of their homelands. Streamline the process of getting work, work authorization. Um, and, you know, Mohammed had the benefit of uh, of the press freedom community uh, behind him. It still took 10 months for him to come to this country and start working. That's uh, unacceptable. So, you know, we need to do whatever we can uh, to make that right, but also to help kickstart his journalism and Zaki's journalism and do whatever we can to, to promote that. And, and just for now, Mohammed is actually working at the National Press Club, doing Thank some IT work for us until you Thank can you. begin working again as a journalist, and I hope that's soon for you. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's fantastic. The National Press Club is doing such uh, important work, um, keeping cases like this to the fore and providing a place for journalists uh, to gather and work and keep doing their jobs and keep having that connection with other journalists. It's part of our, I'm sorry, I just want to say one thing and no. we'll go. It's part of, of the of the club's mission, but I have to single out Bill McCarran. Yes, yeah, amen. Uncle yeah. Bill, uh, the guardian <laughs> angel of in troubled uh, journalists. Uh, it's a growth industry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Mohammed's personal story, though, of leaving Iran, I wonder if you could take us through. You you were in prison, You you knew your fate, for some reason, <laughs> they released you for a little while? And then what happened? Yeah, uh, I decided to leave my country. So I just uh, buy a ticket for the Turkish border. I moved that. And then I just uh, started to walking. He didn't have a passport. Yeah. yeah, the government took my passport and uh, right. I hadn't right to travel uh, with the flight or others. So I was walking in the mountains for one day to uh, cross the countries. That was a winter. So It was a winter? Uh, yeah. Uh, I was frozen. Uh, then Honestly, uh, I was thinking about that, so I'm dying here. But let find uh, some, somewhere to die 
uh, then someone can find your body for your families. Uh, I just working for that, for a good place to die, not for freedom, not for leaving the country in that situation. But, but finally, uh, I found I found the border points. So I climbed a, climbed a hill, and then I found a, just one single bar, sign, one bar uh, signal uh -huh. for emergency call. Uh, on the cell phone, yeah. Yeah, in my cell phone. The fir my first cell phone was died. The second one just have around 15% yeah. battery. Then I called to the Turkish emergency service and s I said, I'm Mohammed, I'm a journalist, I'm in your border and I'm dying here. And they sent the soldiers in that place. I, ju I just said my uh, geographical locations with the Google Maps mm -hmm. and they found me. And after that, uh, I was in the hospital and I think Jason knows better about after that because I was in the <laughs> hospital. <laughs> Uh, quickly, we received news from um, a fellow journalist, um, and when I say we, um, you know, the Committee to Protect Journalists, through my wife Yegi, that Mohammed had fled the country and was uh, hospitalized, but also that he most likely faced imminent deportation back to Iran. Um, and so CPJ sprang into action. Um, they put out a statement that same night calling on Turkish authorities not to deport him. Mm. Um, they were able to hire a lawyer for him. Um, and I'm not sure how effective that person was, but the interventions of CPJ stopped the process. Um, and it made it possible for them to connect Mohammed with, uh, with uh, U.S. diplomats based in Turkey. Um, and these these cases are never easy. I mean, there is a vetting process that has to go on. Uh, you know, uh, Turkey is a country that is not safe yes. for Iranians. Mohammed was there for or journalists for right. or, or exactly, <laughs> especially Iranian journalists, right? Middle Eastern journalists. You're there six months, yeah. six months uh, in semi hiding yes. in, in 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 Ankara. In many cities. In many cities, <laughs> moving yeah. around. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, this is an established journalist who's won prizes by international press freedom organizations. It still took us, you know, we've been at this for a year and a half. I, I, uh, I thank everybody uh, for their support of Mohammed, but we can do so much better, so much faster. Uh, and I'm just so excited that he's here, that he's safe, that he's free, that he has his voice back. Now it's on us in this community to amplify his voice. I mean, I've never heard of anyone walking across the land border from Iran. I don't, has it ever been done before? People do it sometimes. They do. People do it sometimes. Uh, it's not a good end. <laughs> but yeah. Nobody's choice. Yeah. Nobody's no, first no. choice. Yeah. Yeah. If you yeah. see the film Argo and you look at the mountains outside of Tehran, there's snow. These are... It's treacherous. 10,000 yeah. feet? 12,000. 12,000 yeah. feet? Yeah. This is a crazy yeah. feat. Yeah. Many people that lost their lives. Their lives. Yeah. Dead. I see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I say something? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have to say it's not about the Iranian journalist, it's about you uh, in Iran situation because uh, you can travel to Iran, same of us. The uh, free media can do work in Iran. None of the free media, mass media uh, haven't the office in Iran in this situation. And Iran is the bottom of the list of ranking today RSF yeah. said about Iran, it's 178 in 180 countries. And just the Eritrea and North Korea have a worse than Iran. Yeah. 
and uh, I have a, I think it's a valid question if the West, if the free world can keep the cameras on in the Iran nuclear facility, yeah. why they can't keep the media cameras on in Iran streets? Uh, I want to say if you are a journalist in the United States, it keeps your government accountable about your rights to report from Iran for Iranians and for other peoples. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. so much. Um, Very well said. Yes, yes. Um, with that, I think we're out of time unless everyone has time to stay for a few more minutes to touch on some other subjects. What have Bill? we not done that we've Oh my promised? gosh, we have so many. Um, so i uh, love to talk a little bit about Ukraine, journalists being killed there. We have uh, the case of Hayes Fawn in China. Um, and uh, I can so do it if I have a chance to send a message. Do you want to? I just need to duck out. And sure. Well, sure. I, don't, yeah. I think there's a couple of people that need to do that. If you can come back, come back, and Jen and I will continue yeah, we'll, a little we'll, bit. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit. How about we talk a little bit, a little bit Hayes Fawn while, while sure. everyone gets right. settled and, yeah. and stays a little longer. Thank you so much. I know uh, our viewers online will be pleased to hear that you're willing to stay just a little longer. Uh, to hit on some of these other really important issues. I don't want anything to really be missed. Okay. Um, so, you know, about eight blocks from here, RSF is, is soon announcing its World Press Freedom Index for the year. And if the trends hold up, uh, we'll probably see that China once again leads the world in jailed journalists. Um, so, Bill, let's talk about the Hayes fan case. Sure. Um, I know not much is known, but tell us what we do know and how did we miss an opportunity during the Olympics to raise the pressure here? Well, that last part is a really good question. I, I, it was a golden opportunity to call attention to this case. It's a complicated case um, in terms of the strategy of press freedom organizations because Hayes, also, though she was working for Bloomberg, she is a Chinese national. So China would say, this is our internal problem, and you know, there's nothing really for you all to be saying about it. Now, um, there, was a, there have been rumors that she was charged in some sort of an espionage uh, court. And the thing about that is it, it may or may not be uh, related to any kind of espionage activity, probably is not, of course. But uh, the court is, uh, has a, a level of secrecy that you really can't ask questions. They don't have to follow the same kinds of conventions. Okay. So uh, China has not charged her with anything that we know of, and that is also a strategy. If they had, then there would be room for some sort of a legal, legal activity, which Bloomberg would be open to supporting. So no charges against her and no information about her. Her family, such as we know, is you know quite concerned. Um, so they're not, uh, we're not in touch with the family. They're not doing anything to try to continue, uh, lead a case the way they say the Tices are. Uh, but Bloomberg is very interested in her freedom. And, and um, this is someone I think I should say, she, she's worked for three or four leading news organizations, AFP, uh, Al Jazeera, now Bloomberg. So she's, she's well known in this. I'll say one last thing about her. Uh, Chinese nationals are not supposed to work as, uh, as reporters. They are supposed to assist uh, under this Chinese statute uh, j journalists in sort of like a logistical way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it could be that they're going to make a case that she was doing something she wasn't supposed to do. But uh, well, she wasn't doing anything she hasn't been doing in her career all along. Um, and, it, you know, it, it is just a, it, it's an uh, arbitrary, unjust detention. In today's Washington Post, there's a full page ad calling for uh, the release of Hayes Fan. And this is the kind of thing, it's for World Press Freedom Day, and I'm glad it's there, but this is the kind of thing that the media should have been doing while uh, we were in China. I watched the Olympics, you watched mm -hmm. the Olympics, mm -hmm. we probably saw, I probably saw a dozen shots of the Great Wall. I, I don't need to see the Great Wall anymore, I know what that is. But I, we didn't hear anything really about these press freedom cases, and right. I, I, and the words Hayes fan were not uttered the entire time. Mm -hmm. So missed opportunity. For yes. Sure. Um, anything that you think that the club or uh, we can be doing um, 
to assist in this situation, or is this sort of a watch and see uh, type of situation at this time? Well, we should be continuing to be in touch with Bloomberg and mm -hmm. see what they can do. Um, also, there is very little that's written by anyone other than Bloomberg, and so that's that's an interesting uh, part of the case. We've seen this in we saw this in the beginning of Jason's case, where the Washington Post would write, and then other people might comment, but no one else was doing original reporting, trying to get out ahead of it, mm -hmm. trying to ask the kind of questions. I think for there to be pressure on Hayes, it has uh, for Hayes's case, it has to be more than just Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. The rest of the journalism community needs to be engaged. And I'd like to see stories in the New York Times and stories in the Wall Street Journal and so forth. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's jump over and, and talk a little bit about uh, Ukraine, and, and hopefully we'll be joined by uh, Jason and Kathy again, because um, I'd love to get their take on this as well. Sure. Um, you know, it, it's not easy to get our arms around all the things that are happening um, there, including attacks on the press. Uh, we believe dozens of journalists are known to be killed in Ukraine, um, or at least a dozen. Uh, who knows? I mean, we, we keep finding, we have recently seen reports finding bodies of journalists who had been killed likely a month or longer um, ago. Um, so we're not really sure what's happening to every journalist out there, and, and many are, are also getting wounded. Um, so let's talk about these numbers um, and what they mean uh, to you in terms of, you know, obviously it looks like the rules of engagement are off, but um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the Russians are bringing the war to uh, communities. They're attacking uh, civilian locations, apartment buildings. Uh, you know, all, right. nothing is, seems to be off limits. Hospitals, and so um, you know, the the chances that journalists are also going to be caught up in that are extremely high. So that that's what we that's part of what we see. We also have seen targeting. We've seen instances where it seems like the Russians are following a cell phone for in one case of uh, in one of these journalists. And so um, th th there is specific intent and so mm -hmm. where there is intent it needs to be examined as a potential war crime. But just getting the numbers themselves is is daunting. Uh, White House Correspondents Dinner did a nice job of trying to put a human face on the journalists who mm -hmm. had been killed and they, they told us a little bit or showed us a little bit about them. And I believe they said nine, but we're counting twelve. Right. And um, and it, it you you alluded to some of the problem is uh, s sometimes these things are happening, but we're not really finding out until mm -hmm. until later. So it's a it's it's very hard to keep track of it and to quantify um, the extent of the problem. But it's a it is a severe problem. Um, just the other day, there was a missile strike that was. Uh, intended to be close uh, to where um, uh, international officials from the UN were right. meeting, and the whole purpose was either to hit that building or to or to scare them. And that in that building was a a, a journalist right. from Radio for Europe, and and she, and she died. And it's men and women that are dying, uh, that are journalists that are in the field, um, and that's just you know. We would not know what's happening there without without mm -hmm. journalists, often, most often, Ukrainian journalists, yeah. reporting and bringing that information b back to us. And so there's incredible bravery. There's incredible risk, particularly on the visual journalists who have to be close enough to see the problem. Mm -hmm. So their, their feet are going to be in a place where they are in danger. Right. Um, and I, I would l l like to say that uh, things will get better. I will shout out to uh, Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and some others who have done a fundraising around flak jackets and helmets and some other things that the Ukrainian journalists especially don't seem to have. Mm -hmm. um, and try to help equip people to reduce the number of casualties related to shrapnel and, you know, and, 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 and single gunshot. But we're seeing journalists killed when buildings come down. We're seeing right. journalists killed in sort of mass extinction events. And um, right. th that, unfortunately, that looks like it will continue. And I think what seems to be more striking um, than in some other conflicts is just uh, the fact that journalists are, are being targeted. You know, they're not 
getting caught in the line of fire. Um, you know, it, it's almost like the, the Russian military is, is looking for Ukrainian journalists, specifically Ukrainian journalists um, who may be on a list. Uh, but they're also seeing, you know, if you've got press somewhere written on yourself, you know, you're a, you've got a bullseye on your back, um, as opposed to in other conflicts where, you know, if you have that, the, the idea is to avoid hitting those people, just like medics, you know, things like that. But we're, all, all rules are off the table this time. And so uh, the bravery of these journalists is just, I mean, it's incredible to know that not only are you going into a dangerous situation, you're also going into a situation where you are being sought out as a target to be killed. Yeah, it's, it's quite right. The, those norms, there's no, there's no Geneva Convention there. There's no uh, paying attention to right. the rules of engagement. And, and, and war does have rules. I mean, right. people for, tend to forget that, but there is a code of military law, and you're not supposed to fire on civilians. I mean, exactly. that's, that's thing one. I wanted to mention quickly, in this, in this case in Ukraine, about uh, uh, something that happened to the Fox crew. So there was a, right. they were um, hit with a projectile, two were, two were killed, mm -hmm. uh, one is injured and, and in the States. And uh, in the aftermath of that, um, it was unclear uh, what had happened, where they were taken, uh, what kind of s status they were in. And American journalists, including, I understand from reading uh, Clarissa Ward from CNN, right. jumped on the phones doing what they do. They were calling morgues, they were calling hospitals, they were calling police stations. They were trying to track these folks down. And so, right. so it's a reminder that when there is a war, it, is, it, it, it can be a sort of a leveler of those uh, kind of competitive structures that, you know, that exist, but fall by the wayside in times of crisis. And right. it's, um, they, they did find them. Uh, through that uh, shoe leather kind of work. And, um, you know, it's, I don't know how that, I don't know how to characterize that, but it, it there were some feelings there for me yeah, listening well, to that. Well, my feeling is somebody who's been a reporter and in that competitive situation and then also now uh, an advocate, I, I really think since the Trump administration, there has been more collaboration and cooperation uh, because uh, for all that uh, the former president may have done in Austin Tice's case, which is great, uh, we do know that generally he uh, targeted journalists um, and, um, and I think that brought journalists together. So even at the White House, uh, when people were trying to kick out the CNN correspondent, Fox spoke up. And uh, similarly, there were times in the Obama White House when uh, the Obama White House wanted to keep Fox out and uh, other journalists spoke up for Fox. So I think uh, there is this uh, a greater professional solidarity now than there used to be um, because I think we all understand uh, that we are under threat and, um, and, I think, and I think that's true for journalists. I think what we've been talking about at the table today is it's really important for people who aren't journalists to stand up for this too, because what's really at stake here, this isn't about journalism, it's about democracy. Absolutely. Um, so I don't know if, if Jason is returning. I don't um, think so. Okay. He had another, <laughs> um, he had another, yeah, he had another appointment. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so I, I did want him to talk about this, but if either of you have any thoughts um, on, you know, Basically, you know, there's some important court cases coming up um, uh, or that have been at the forefront yeah. this year, uh, one being uh, the Jamal Khashoggi case and, and the case of the Beatles in Virginia. Um, so I know this is, this is not what you expected to talk about, but if you have any thoughts on these uh, two particular cases and what they mean uh, for us uh, in, in terms of press freedom. Um, sure, I think the Khashoggi you. case is, I mean, it's sad. Um, there was a feeling that we were going to see some form of justice, in, you know, in Turkey that they were stepping in. Um, there was a fear, I think, from the f from his family uh, or from Hadija Sinjens, his fiance, that you know this was a could possibly be a farce, and that you know it was just take some time off the clock and act like you're doing something. Um, but I think to have the reality at the end of this that the case is going to return to Saudi Arabia where, where nothing is going to happen. 
just confirms, you know, for everybody that at least on this level they got away with this, mm -hmm. and um, that is, that's that's a that's a sad reality. Yeah, I just want to interject here that I think. Um, Saudi Arabia is a case that's um, really galling because, to me, because um, it is a case where if you have enough money, you can get away with murder. And uh, I have a student um, who I put on this case uh, at the University of Missouri. Her name is Elise Mulligan. She's done, I, I call out her name because she's done terrific work. She's an undergraduate. And um, she does research on the FARA records for me. And we have tracked more than uh, $30 million in profits made by American lobbying companies and American lobbyists uh, working for the Saudis, lobbying, trying to polish the Saudis' image in the United States. That $30 million since Khashoggi's murder. So I really, this is just where I say to people, who are in the United States and who are lucky enough to benefit from our incredible system of democracy. Really? Right. Really? Um, and I, you know, at some point the world has, and Turkey, the, the fact that it's moving out of Turkey doesn't surprise me. Uh, Recep Erdogan is not a friend of the free press. Uh, he was, what he did with Khashoggi was a strategic maneuver to help him in the region's politics and now he's done with that case. But the United States of America, we should be able to take a stand and we should really be able to um, just continuously say, no, we're not going to take your money if this is the kind of thing you do. Absolutely. Okay. Bill, any more thoughts or we talk uh, a little bit about the Beatles? Yes. So there, I mean, I think what that case, which, which uh, um, uh, involved an extradition of a, a British citizen to the United States to be tried. There was a negotiation. The families who were involved asked that the death penalty not be uh, part of the process, mm -hmm. and that that is credited with uh, being the reason why extradition was allowed. Um, I think what it says at the end of the day is that there is, unlike the Khashoggi case, there is a day of reckoning, there is a day in court, there is a, a kind of justice and closure for the families. Think of the incredible bravery of the families like uh, just Diane Foley who will be here uh, tomorrow for her organization's um, a big event to sit a few feet away from someone who had been involved in the uh, abduction, torture, ultimately murder of your, of your child. I, I can't imagine the kind of strength that uh, allows you to sit through that, right. but I know her and I know there's nowhere else she would be on a day like that. And um, I, I think it really did mean something to the families, but I wanna talk about uh, what it means for our country. I mean, we did press on this. We did try to get this done. And um, just th locating these guys uh, it is a big deal. Just the sort of legwork it took to make sure we had that person, that was that individual. These were the things that person did. Get them to some form of you know, confession by connecting dots. It's, a, it's not a satisfying thing, right, because we're talking about people's lives lost. But there's, to not follow through like that and to not have that kind of outcome, I think, is really a, a terrible. Mm -hmm. And so I am, happy is not the right word, but I'm uh, really attentive to what was done there and, uh, and, thinks, and I think we learned a lot. Uh, of what can be proven in a court of law. Okay, great. Um, I, I'd love to ask you both just to, to sum up uh, y the year in press freedom. Um, is it hopeless? Was there progress? Uh, what really stood out to you this year? Well, what stood out to me was the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, a journalist, two journalists winning the Nobel Peace Prize, I think, um, was a, a powerful message from people who are not journalists. 
uh, about the importance of journalism in the world and the threat that journalists are under. So um, it's, it's not, uh, as Jason said about winning the Obishan Award, sometimes uh, awards are not good news because it means you're in danger, but the fact that other people are recognizing that danger and uh, recognizing the need to alleviate it, I think is a, is a, a very important first step um, to restoring uh, not just journalism, but civil society. Well said, Kathy. And I, you know, I, you, uh, the media is not great about covering itself, understandably, <laughs> and so the greatest uh, weapon in the public relations war about press freedom should be journalism, but it's hard. But when Maria wins the Nobel Peace Prize, this is something that can be covered. This is news for itself. So it's a great moment that we can really celebrate. And um, there's, no, there's no issue with journalists covering that. They're covering who's the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. That's a natural thing. Yeah, it is hard. And let's also say the name of her co-winner, Dmitry Murtov, because yes. Russian journalists uh, right now, I think there's a tendency to sort of say, oh, the Russians, they're the bad guys. But there are good Russians. They are, there are Russian journalists who are being exiled from their own communities. And just as we need to help uh, the Afghan journalists and the Iranian journalists, we need to set up a system. And this is why I think we need to have a system in place to help these journalists who would love to continue working and be sending real news as opposed to the Putin propaganda right. to their to their uh, country. So um, I just hope that we can, uh, people of goodwill can come together and uh, develop a model, as Zaki said, um, to, to help us help journalists. Absolutely. And Murtov has had to close down his um, yes. his publication, uh, you know, for the time being, while the mm -hmm. because he's not allowed to write <coughs> about what's happening in Ukraine. And I think that was the right move. Absolutely. I mean, you send a message, you say, I can't do my job. I'm not going to do it half-baked. I, I can't be a real journalist, so I, I'm, I'm going to have to close. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you both for, for and to, to Jason and, and everyone else who's joined us today uh, for spending World Press Freedom uh, here at the National Press Club. Uh, today, we've tried to show just a glimpse of the world of press freedom in what has now been two hours. Um, we at the Press Club consider ourselves to be a significant press freedom organization, um, and we appreciate the chance for a strategic collaboration with many other good groups in the field. Uh, but we're more than a building, and our role is not limited to this venue or this country. Uh, we have a lot to offer families and news organizations that find their reporters at risk, uh, we're motivated to use our tools and skills to obtain freedom for journalists, and we have a track record of success. Uh, press freedom is a central goal of my presidency, and I'm sure it will be equally important to other presidents who will follow me. Thank you so much for listening, and have a great World Press Freedom Day.